Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Tears in My Gumbo, changing the narrative about caregivers with author Nadine Roberts Cornish and a panel of wonderful caregivers. We are so grateful that you're here with us today for this program. It is a collaboration between Denver Public Library and Changing the Narrative. Um, my name is Jen Dewey and I'm a librarian at Denver Public Library. Here at the library, we believe in creating and nurturing strong community where everyone thrives. And today I know we're doing just that by gathering here. And though we can't be in person right now, we are committed to bringing you enriching experiences as best we can virtually too. So with that in mind, just a couple of small housekeeping things before we get started. Closed captioning is enabled. If you cannot see it and would like to turn it on for yourself, um, click the CC live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, or it might just say CC, and you can select one of the options there to turn the captioning on and off for yourself. Um, we're going to put this instruction in the chat as well. You may have noticed that you are muted as you came in, um, just because of the large group that we have here today, which we are so grateful to have. Um, we're going to keep everyone muted for the duration of the program, but the chat is open. So be kind to one another there and keep in mind that um, our panelists and guests might not be monitoring the chat while they're speaking and might not see exactly what's coming up there. So just to let you know a little bit how the program is going to run today, we're going to start with a conversation with Janine and Nadine for about 30 minutes. Then we will invite our other panelists on and have a conversation with them for about another 25 minutes or so. And then we will open it up for question and answer in the chat. Um, I will be moderating that and I promise to try to do my best to get as many questions to our panelists as possible. So we are recording this program, but we wanna let you know that no participant information, no names or images are going to be recorded. We are going to post the recording on the Denver Public Library YouTube page later so you can return and rewatch it. And we will also be sending a follow-up email with links to resources that we mentioned during the program. Um, so feel free to sit back and relax and really enjoy the conversation. I wanna let you know that Denver Public Library is offering curbside services at all of our 26 Denver locations and we are having limited in-person hours at nine of our locations. We also have a huge array of virtual programs for all ages, ebooks, streaming movies and music, and tons more. And you can see all of that at denverlibrary.org. So like I mentioned earlier, this program is a collaboration with Changing the Narrative. Um, I'm so honored to welcome our moderator today, Janine Vanderberg, who is director and chief catalyst of Changing the Narrative. I'll put her up so you guys can see her too. Um, Changing the Narrative is a campaign to change the way people think, talk, and act about aging and ageism. She chairs the Encore Network, which is a global coalition of leaders who champion the civic, social, and economic contributions of people age 50 plus, and is an Encore Public Voices Fellow. She is a former member of the Denver Commission on Aging and also won the Mayor's Diversity and Inclusion Award for her advocacy of older adults. Over the years, she has changed the narrative around aging for so many people, including Denver Public Library staff, our customers, and definitely me personally. And for that, I thank you so much, Janine. So everyone, please welcome Janine Vanderberg. Jennifer, thank you so much. And I am so thrilled to be here with all of you. We've been looking forward to this so much since I had the uh, privilege of meeting Nadine some time ago. Um, before we get started in our program, I'm very mindful that today is March 11th, and it was one year ago that the World Health Organization declared that we were in a global pandemic. So I'd like us to take a moment to remember those we've lost and all of us who have become caregivers during that time. Thank you. 
So as Jennifer mentioned, uh, changing the narrative is basically about changing the way we think, talk, and act about aging and older people. It's a campaign that is funded by Next 50 Initiative and Rose Community Foundation, who both understand that as we are in a society, a community, a state that's aging, we need to think differently about policies and systems and what is needed to uh, support communities in which we can all thrive. And certainly part of that is caregiving. Why do we partner with Denver Public Library? I had the privilege of meeting uh, Denver Public Library staff in 2018, our first year of changing the narrative. And one of the things that I realized were two things that are important to narrative change. One, libraries are very trusted institutions. So in a time when there's a lot of skepticism about knowledge and source of facts, people trust their libraries. So when we are trying to communicate a different story being able to partner with trusted institutions is really important. So that was reason number one. The other thing that I think most of us realize is we live in a pretty age segregated society. There is a lot of us versus them. There are younger people over here and older people over uh, here. And one of the things I realize every time I walk into a library is how age integrated and how we have opportunities to connect and meet each other in libraries. So that's, um, that's why we partner and I'm thrilled to be able to partner on this program. So with that, I want to get to our topic of the day, which is caregiving and changing the narrative about caregiving and, and about caregivers. I think sometimes when we hear the word caregiver, we have a certain kind of image in mind and, and we don't realize kind of the broad spectrum of people who've taken on that role, as well as the fact that um, they consider it a gift. So we are going to start with author Nadine Cornish. Nadine is not only an author and a national speaker, she's a certified senior advisor, a gerontologist, and with a background in public health, she began her most important role that she describes as being a 15-year caregiver to her own mother. When that journey ended, Nadine knew that caregiving, consulting, education, and co uh, coaching was going to be her life's work, and for the last 12 years, she's done exactly that. She's the author of two books, and hopefully some of you in this audience will be receiving them after uh, this session, uh, Tears in My Gumbo, The Caregiver's Recipe for Resilience, and Prayers in My Gumbo, The Caregiver's Recipe for Peace, and it's part of a multi-series, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, towards the end of our session together. Uh, so with that, I would like uh, to welcome Nadine on our virtual stage, and we'll start our conversation. Well, thank you so very much, Janine. I'm thrilled to be here and really appreciative of the um, to both changing the narrative and Denver Public Library for recognizing the importance of this topic and the necessity of having this conversation. Okay, so Nadine, you've queued up my first question beautifully. <laughs> why is it important? Why is it important for us to talk about caregiving, and why now? Um, this is um, the perfect storm for caregivers. Um, I always say that there are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been a caregiver, those who are a caregiver, those who will be a caregiver, and those who will need a caregiver. So caregiving impacts all of us, whether we choose to acknowledge that we're caregivers, whether, we, um, whether we're very vocal about caregiving and the support that we need and the resources that are limited or missing, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many people now, 53 million was the number prior to the pandemic. And since the pandemic, I would, would just simply guess because we don't have the numbers yet, that there is probably another 15 to 20 million caregivers that are now part of the pool of family caregivers, unpaid caregivers who every day selflessly take care of a loved one with or without acknowledgement. Um, and they do this because this is who they are. They do it because of the relationship that they have and, and um, how they feel about the person, um, their, their loved one, their family member. And um, it's just an incredible uh, experience. It's good on a lot of days. On other days, it's definitely not so good. And it's one of the greatest challenges that we experience 
as caregivers. So now is absolutely the time to have the discussion. Also, who we think of as a caregiver has changed dramatically over the past year. We have children who are caring for grandparents at this point in time. We have, um, we have college students, high school students. We have spouses who are caring. We have um, uh, individuals who take care of their families every single day uh, who are now responsible for taking care of their young children and their aging parents as well. And so it really wreaks the gamut. And now is absolutely the time to have this discussion. And last but not least, Janine, as you well know, with baby boomers turning 65, 10,000 of them turning 65 every single day, we've got a lot of people that are aging into the system and that will, will need help. They will need support. They will need caregivers and the conversation has to happen on a daily basis now. Great, thank you so much. So of course, your books are so intriguingly named. Tell us about your story about caregiving and why are these books named Gumbo? And I'm, I'm adding this in, this was not on the list. <laughs> your Gumbo recipe. No problem. Yeah. So my caregiving story started, you know, uh, gosh, over almost 25 years ago now when I was simply minding my own business, right? I was living my best life and the phone rang and it was my mother's uh, neuros uh, neurologist calling to say that she had been diagnosed with a pituitary brain tumor. And that day literally changed the trajectory of our lives. Uh, we went through the the whole gamut, you know, experiencing a sense of helplessness, um, a, a sense of recognition around the fact that we really didn't know what we didn't know. <laughs> we were real clear about that part, that there was a lot that we needed to know that we didn't know. We went through the process, the process of figuring out what do we do? How do we do this? Um, how is mom going to be cared for on a 24-hour basis? When is she going to have the surgery? Uh, learning about the intricacies of the healthcare system. All of these things were factors in that we had to figure out quick, fast, and in a hurry. And there was no one to call. There was no real support. I was very fortunate in that I had a background in public health. I knew how to advocate. I knew how to... Um, I knew, I knew how to ask the tough questions and I knew how to research on my own at, um, at that particular point in time. And so I realized that I had an advantage and I was gonna take full advantage of that advantage as we navigated this um, amazing path that we were on. My mother's caregiving uh, journey, my mother's illness spanned the course of close to 15 years. And we experience all of the highs, all of the lows. We experience the joys, the sorrows, the shock, the dismay, the disbelief around the, um, the healthcare system and uh, the disbelief around the cost associated with long-term care, what it costs to actually have someone come into the home. We did investigate what the cost of long-term care was and found out that that was absolutely cost prohibitive. And for me personally, it wasn't an option because I'm the oldest, I'm mama's girl, and I was going to take care of my mother as long as I was able to do so. So navigating systems that I was not familiar with with was, was a big part of the process. I didn't know, Janine, that my journey was literally preparing me for my life's work because I thought that when my caregiving journey ended, I literally would, you know, go back to my old life and, you know, kind of get back to all of the things that I had missed over, um, over this, this long time period, right? And um, you know how they say you make, you make plans and God laughs? Well, literally, uh, as um, we came to the end of our journey and my mother transitioned very peacefully after a really, really long period of time, almost 15 years, 
when my mother transitioned, I thought, okay, I'll get back to my life. And very, very soon, I began to realize that getting back to my life would not happen. I really had to understand that my caregiving journey had prepared me for the work that I really was placed here to do. My mother had said, yes, she had been the volunteer, and I really had been uh, on, a, on a journey, on a journey to prepare to support family caregivers. So as of today, the Caregiver's Guardian has supported well over a thousand families across the country over this 12 year span where that we provided services. So a year following my mom's, uh, my mom's passing, I launched the Caregiver's Guardian, Guardian, a support services organization specifically designed to support family caregivers, to help them navigate the waters, to help them understand the necessity of self-care, the necessity of creating a plan, the uh, necessity of understanding the five steps of conscious caregiving, uh, which we talked about in the first book that I wrote called Tears in My Gumbo, The Caregiver's Recipe for Resilience. So Janine, you asked me, how did I come up with gumbo, the, the whole gumbo series? Well, I'm from New Orleans, born and raised, and I tell everybody, gumbo is in my DNA. Every family, no matter, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, there is that one dish, that one dish that represents food for the soul that one dish that represents love, it represents family, it represents the good times, the great times, and sometimes it represents the sad times. And for my family, it was gumbo. Creating gumbo was something that we did in community. A family, my mom's sisters would come over, my cousins would come over, and we would all kind of get a station in the kitchen, and everybody would be either chopping slices, peeling shrimp, or um, doing whatever they were assigned to do. And collectively, we created this amazing dish that we know as New Orleans seafood gumbo. And all throughout my caregiving journey, I always thought about the analogy of preparing the gumbo, and the caregiving journey. Yeah, you can prepare it by yourself, but preparing it in community with support is absolutely better. And caregiving is the exact same way. And so I very early on knew that um, there would be stories. There would be stories written about the caregiving journey. And as I supported families across the country, they would ask me to share their stories because my gift to caregivers after I would work with a family for a period of time would literally be to write, uh, write the caregiver a recap of the experiences and the strengths and the changes that I saw in them during uh, their caregiving journey. And so that literally was uh, the catalyst for the very first book, Tears in My Gumbo, which has been out almost four years now. And we have um, been able to support family caregivers, encourage them, and teach them the five steps of conscious caregiving through the book, uh, Tears in My Gumbo. Help them to understand the five steps of conscious caregiving, which are starting with helplessness. Everybody's kind of familiar with that. <laughs> From helplessness uh, is, is recognition, recognition that you don't know what you don't know. After recognition is processed, which you can be in that particular stage or step for quite some time, you're working through things. You're figuring out that, that you got to take care of yourself first and foremost before you take care of anybody else. You also understand that in process, you got to figure out the resources that are available, identify those resources and use them to the best of your ability so that you are able to navigate the journey effectively and be well and thrive through the process of the journey. And then finally, there's acceptance. I spent most of my caregiving journey not accepting the journey that I was on because I wanted a different realization. I wanted a different outcome and that was not to be. And when you get to that stage of acceptance, you can actually begin to love your loved one for where they are in the moment, where they are at this point in time, appreciating them and being present with them. And then finally, there is surrender. 
surrender. And surrender is simply not my will, but thy will be done. The recognition that we are ultimately not in control. And so the five steps of care, uh, conscious caregiving is what I work with um, caregivers around the country on understanding that, creating a, uh, a plan of care and really getting to a point where they recognize the joy in the journey. Nadine, that's so powerful. Um, thank you for sharing, especially I think those five steps are so important. I want to segue for a moment. One of the things that we do changing the narrative is talk a lot about as we have an aging society, we need different systems, we need different policies, but often what gets in the way are stereotypes that we have, maybe about older people, but also stereotypes about caregivers. If I have a set of stereotypes about who caregiver is, and it's not me, it's easy for me to say, well, I'm not going to support that policy. What does that have to do with me? What are some of those stereotypes about caregivers that you would like to refute? Because you work with caregivers all over the country. I think that's a really good question, Janine. And um, it's, it's a question that I'm so glad that everybody that's participating today, listening in, can contemplate as well. And one of the, uh, the stereotypes that I'd like to nip in the bud is that the caregiver can handle it that they can do it by themselves, that they don't need support, that, oh, you're simply taking care of a loved one, you know, a parent or a, a spouse, a child, or um, a, a dear relative. And so you don't need support. You don't need resources. And that is one of the greatest misconceptions that I would really like to debunk. Caregiving is an awesome responsibility in every way, shape, and form. For those who provide 24-7 caregiving, it, it impacts every facet of their lives. Whether you're a sandwich generation, whether you're a retiree, whether you are someone who literally um, got a phone call the way that I did. I was in the height of my career. I did not have to completely stop working, but I absolutely had to modify what I was doing. And as a result of that, things, you know, it affected my, uh, my livelihood. Uh, it affected when I could work. It probably affected the opportunity to expand my business as well, because my number one priority, once, once I became a, a caregiver to my mother, was my mother. And that was in fact the most important thing. And as a result, people in the prime of their careers, uh, unfortunately, there are people who are, are terminated from really great jobs and careers as a result of their caregiving experience. And so recognizing that support is needed very, very tangible support is needed. And I also realize we probably have individuals who are not active caregivers that are, are participating in the call. We really want supporters of caregivers, especially family members, to recognize that it is a family affair and that everybody has something to bring to the table and should bring whatever it is that they have to the table. I always say it's either your time or your resources. One of the two, it's essential in helping support your primary caregiver and managing the, caregiver, the, the caregiver's journey. The other, um, I guess, stereotype or misperception that I'd like to address is that caregiving takes more away from you than it gives to you. You guys got that? That, that stereotype or myth the belief that caregiving takes more away from you than it gives to you. When you understand the five steps of conscious caregiving and when you are making self-care your, uh, your primary objective, caregiving gives you so much more. I firmly believe with the hundreds of caregivers that I've worked with and with my own personal experience, that caregiving enhances the person. It enhances who you are and who you have the opportunity to become. 
caring for a loved one, supporting someone in their greatest hour of need, I think that it's one of life's greatest blessings. And when your loved one, and ultimately, you know, we, we are a society, we don't like to talk about death. We don't like to talk about the inevitable, but it is inevitable. Nobody's come here to stay. That's a fact. And we don't want to release the people we love so much. But the gift is that when it's all said and done and you have given your best and you have shown up, you have loved, you have cared, you have done your best, there's such a peace, there's such a joy, an inner joy that you get because you grew through the experience of caregiving. You expanded the person that you were and you ultimately became a better person in this selfless act of giving and, in care, uh, and of caring. Nadine, so you've kind of um, somewhat started talking about this and we know we have a lot of caregivers in the room and we also had, um, and, and it strikes me that it's so much part of the caregiving experience right before we went live with this, I started getting emails from people saying, plan to be there. My caregiving responsibilities are kicking in. Um, and so I'm glad that we're able to record this so people can really hear your powerful words. Tell me a little bit about how you stayed hopeful during that journey with your mother. Um, and I say that um, I am mindful that um, you know, my own father, um, my mother had a stroke when she was 70. She, a massive stroke. She lived for a decade um, at home um, and he was her caregiver and he was five years older. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were times that I know he expressed things similar that you could, and there were times that he was like, Janine, I can't take it anymore. Absolutely. How, have, how do you stay hopeful or how did you stay hopeful? And what's your advice to caregivers in the room who kind of have those moments? Absolutely. Often, daily maybe. You know, and Janine, I just saw a question pop, pop up or a comment that said, hard to feel that way when you're in the tr uh, trenches. And you're absolutely right. It is hard to feel that way when you are in the trenches. And part of ensuring that you are taking care of yourself, it means creating a practice, a practice of self-care, a practice of saying yes a practice of acknowledging that you need help. Because there, there was a, another myth uh, that I didn't mention around needing help and accepting help. Caregivers are notorious for not asking for help. They're also notorious for not saying yes when help is offered. And so part of what we do in working with our, our caregivers is helping them understand that it is caregiving is not a solo journey. Uh, support is absolutely required. Even when you can't get that support from families, I've worked with I've worked with individuals where there have been many siblings to support the effort, but because of the dynamics of the family relationship, that person didn't get the support that they needed from the family. But when they became open to the fact that your family may not offer you that support, but there are other resources available that can provide you with support. You also have coworkers and good friends that are constantly asking, what can I do to support you? How can I help you? And so I always teach my caregivers to keep a list. If you could do abracadabra and have somebody at your doorstep to help you, what would be on that list? Write that list down and have it available and get in the practice of saying yes, to help when it is offered. Get in that mode of, um, of recognizing that, hmm, I do a really awesome job. I call it overcoming super caregiver syndrome for those of us that are you know, really uh, intentional about the quality of care that we provide to our loved ones and we think that we're the only person that can provide that care. Overcome that and say yes to allowing other people in to support you say yes to yourself around your self-care, uh, creating a spiritual practice, creating a practice of self-care, whatever that is. I've got one client, her self-care is pulling weeds. She loves going out into the yard, pulling weeds, and that is her idea of self-care. 
my idea of self-care is going to the spa and having a full body massage. She has nothing and no idea around that particular concept. That's not work. That doesn't work for her. But being able to get into the dirt and pull weeds, that works for her. So saying yes to what's most important to you, recognizing that, and I know it can feel so complex, it can feel so overwhelming, saying yes to support systems, saying yes to resources. At the Caregiver's Guardian, we help caregivers figure it out. We help them identify those resources and create the skill sets needed in order to open themselves up to getting the support that they need. Okay. So Nadine, you've talked a bit about kind of the whole friend, family, neighbor, people around you support system. I wanna ask you a final question before we introduce um, the rest of our panelists. I sometimes think that there should be a public role in this and I'd love your take on what kind of, especially, right? We've got an aging society. What kind of systems and public policies would improve things? for family caregivers? So I'm very optimistic that there are, there are systems in the works now to address some of the needs, some of the issues around legislation and uh, public support for the family caregiver in particular. Um, number one, I would love to see uh, funding to support the family caregiver who has reduce the hours that they work in order to provide care. In some instances, and many women, uh, this has happened to many women, particularly over the last year, where they've had to walk away from jobs because they, they are now full-time caregivers. So absolute support, financial support to allow them to, uh, to maintain a livelihood as they provide a much needed service. Um, ultimately, caregivers are the backbone, backbone of our health care system. And as a result, I believe every, health, every caregiver should be con uh, compensated. So certainly legislation around that, but also legislation around job protection, job security, so that when, uh, when you take family medical leave, that you are not um, targeted and your job doesn't become... Uh, is a place at risk as a result of the fact that you're using um, let, uh, using you are using family medical leave that you are entitled to, and so that those those are the two primary things that I would really like to see happen around legislation. Nadine, thanks so much. And actually, for those of you who are based in Colorado, on Monday, the Colorado State Legislature introduced some um, amendments to Colorado's current anti-discrimination bill that would actually protect caregivers. So I don't have all the details. Please don't ask me about it. But I, I will include a link to it in the resources that go out after. Because I, So Nadine, I am hopeful that there is a trend because this is so important. And as you said at the outset, um, each of us is either a caregiver, has been a caregiver, will be one, or will need one. So with that, I, um, you know, part of our changing the narrative is to make sure that we understand the breadth of people who become caregivers. So we wanted to share, in addition to Nadine's expertise and Nadine's story, a panel of um, caregivers, and I'm going to introduce them uh, one by one, and then we will um, ask them some questions as well, and then we will open it up to all of you for questions and answers. And I can see by the number of comments popping in the chat, I think there are already um, a number of questions. So first, uh, let me introduce uh, Ray Castiano. Um, Ray, um, I have met through Encore Public Voices Fellows. He is also a fellow. But he paused his biotech career and moved to St. Louis from LA to be a caregiver for both of his parents, but primarily for his father who suffered a stroke in 2014. He also is the founder of Table Wisdom, um, an extraordinary intergenerational program that brings together older adults and foreign born students for professional mentoring and conversational English speaking uh, sessions. So you can see Ray's changing the narrative in a number of ways, but uh, welcome Ray. Uh, next, 
Um, we have Amy Delpo, uh, my colleague, Denver Public Library. Amy works uh, full time as the administrator of older adult services at the Denver Public Library. And she also is the primary caregiver for her father who has Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Add to this three children, a husband and a dog. And you can see Amy's life is quite full and a little chaotic. And yet, Amy, you answer my emails. Thank you. She brings both professional and personal knowledge to her perspective on caregiving. And finally, I would like to introduce uh, Matilda Shellman. So Matilda is a social worker with an MSW who describes herself as having been blessed to serve at a community mental health center church daycare center, group homes, youth shelters, a halfway house, and several home health care settings. She currently is an active caregiver to her own mother and is thrilled to be a contributing author to Nadine's book, uh, Prayers of My Journey. Um, her, her statement was, it is a joy to be able to love myself and others on your caregiving journey. So please take a moment and sort of silently welcome uh, our new panelist. And we're going to go ahead and get questions. And I want to start, um, I'm actually, Nadine, gonna, going to read a quote from the forward of uh, your book, A Tears of My Gumbo. It really sp uh, spoke to me for a number of reasons, and certainly to this year of COVID-19. Life is full of twists and turns. The unexpected is the norm. We know this, but the role of caregiver is a part that no one should be prepared, that no one can be prepared to experience. You can know that it is coming. You can think that you are ready. Yet feelings of overwhelm and powerlessness can rush in without warning. Most of us have a deep desire to be present and do the right thing for the people we love when they are in need. However, we do not come encoded with a manual on caregiving. And as I ask each of you to share your own caregiving story, if you could kind of talk about those moments of unexpectedness as well. So um, Ray, I'm going to start with you. Can you share with us your story of caregiving at your life stage? Yes. Um, hey, everybody. Thanks again for uh, this opportunity and for your time. A lot of what Nadine uh, said resonated with me. So um, so it's tricky to be an Asian male care caregiver because it bucks the trend. You know, at this stage in my life where my peers have families or doing things in their career, it can sound odd to hear someone say, you know, I'm a caregiver. So, you know, a little, a little bit about me. I'm an immigrant from the Philippines, came with my family with very little resources in 1989, lived in a 10-1 bedroom, rough part of Los Angeles. So my parents raised me to chase after the right and practical opportunities, you know, towards the American dream, you know, like universities, right grades, right jobs, you know, et cetera. So I was in the middle of my biotech career back in LA when I agreed to move my parents, <clears throat> moved to Seattle for, I mean, St. Louis for work, to move them back to Los Angeles and reunite with my family. So um, in February, 2014, that's when my father suffered a stroke, which overnight thrusted me into the role of caregiver. So that was very difficult for me to accept because I was also raised to believe that that role felt, fell exclusively on women. The image of masculinity as, you know, this machismo, stoic financial provider, only made it very difficult for me to be open about it and talk to other male caregivers, you know? Um, <laughs> not only that, I was on the younger age of that spectrum of caregivers. So, since 2014, my dad has depended on me for most of his activities of daily living, including bathing, groceries, cooking, and driving to you know, therapies. You see, like many younger caregivers like myself, we experience financial double whammy. First, you know, we earn reduced income because we have to reduce the number of hours that we work. And then second, we face long-term consequences as well because we contribute less you know, in our retirement to end social security. So, um, so yeah, so most recently when I heard about Biden's caregiving plan, I got a little bit hopeful because, you know, the pandemic's put a spotlight on how broken the caregiving, caregiving system is at this stage. So it kind of um, makes me hopeful that, you know, the home and community-based services could be expanded so that potentially I could, you know, return to my career. So yes, I recommend being with your legislators, uh, being in contact with them, 
to remind them about their about the caregiving. So it's complicated, you know, literally, it's a life giving role. Uh, and yet it's not openly discussed. I think uh, we must reimagine and broaden our definition of today's masculinity. One that is grounded on compassion, empathy, sacrifice, or selfless acts. Thank you. Ray, thank you so much. And, and thank you for acknowledging this sort of the stereotype that caregivers are women when we know an increasing number of men are caregivers and for sharing your story. Amy, tell us about you. Hi everyone, um, I'm so honored to be here uh, with Nadine and everyone else on the panel and with all of you. Um, and I just have to, before I start my spiel, my father's name is Ray and he was the caregiver to my mother. And um, so I just admire you so much, Ray, um, and have experienced in my own life how beautiful uh, a male caregiver can be, even in our culture. Um, so my caregiving journey uh, started, um, my mother uh, had Alzheimer's and I helped my father care for her. Um, she passed away about four years ago. And um, I don't know how my father did it, but he managed to care for her beautifully up until the end. And then very, very quickly, he received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's and then also Parkinson's. Um, and so he is now uh, living here in Denver. Uh, I'm his primary caregiver. And I also have three children who I'm caring for at the same time. Um, my experience in caring for my mother and my father um, has been wonderful and painful and rich and depleting and everything in between. Um, but I do share with Nadine so much of what she said really resonated with me. And much like Nadine, it absolutely forged a path for my life's work. Um, at the library, I now specialize in older adult services and I'm creating um, a, a model for public libraries to provide programming and um, services and training for people with memory loss, for people with Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's and their caregivers and their family members so that people who are caregiving have a place to go in their community, a home for them and their loved one. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what the rest of the panel has to say and seeing what's in the chat. But I think this is such an important thing um, because I even, I experienced much of what Ray experienced, which is not very many people I know at my stage in life are caring for their parents. I feel like I'm kind of on my own um, I don't have models around me. So it's been, a, it's been kind of a lonely uh, pursuit. So thank you, everyone. Amy, thank you so much. And now I'm, I, I warned that I might get weepy, but um, my father, the caregiver, also named Ray. So I'm just, there's a pattern emerging here. Um, um, I, I also saw this other kind of common thread with what you um, and Nadine and Amy have talked about so far is the caregiving experience kind of shaping your life work. Ray, I know kind of some of your work of table wisdom and the idea of matching older people with a younger people who need who wanted to learn English came out of your caregiving experience as well. So we've got sort of an interesting thread here. Matilda, tell us about your caregiving journey. First of all, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity just to be here and to share. Um, I've been enriched by the other stories that have already come forth. Um, my journey. So six years ago, my mom came to live with us um, and my husband and I were empty nesters. So we had started our journey of empty nesters and planning vacations and, and looking forward to that. And then um, we got a phone call. One Monday morning, we got a phone call that changed our life as well. But um, as a family, we had always talked about the fact that if something were to happen and, you know, and we knew that e eventually it would, because that's part of life, um, that mom would come and stay with us. And my husband and I have been caregivers for my mom. But I want to say the most important thing for me is you know, we often hear the cliche, but it really is a truism, that it takes a village to raise a child. But um, 
as seniors, it takes a community to support a senior. It truly does. And for me, I have been blessed. I have been blessed with my background in social work, been blessed with a family that we do work together and support one another. But I have an extended family as well. Um, for me, we're talking about things that um, I heard the story of someone pulling weeds. Well, for me, it's been my faith life. And having, having faith in God for me has been my stronghold. When I talk about community, uh, my mom is blessed to be a part of a community of widows and they pray for each other. They support one another and they check on one another. And especially during this time of pandemic, it has been invaluable for her to still have that support group available for her. And then for myself, um, the caregiver's guardian has been such a blessing to my life because through the caregiver's guardian, um, I got two caregivers that came to the house to support um, and take care of my mom while husband and I were able to go out on a, on a date or you know just take care of some business affairs. And that has been invaluable as well. And then the community, the faith community, I have, I have those around me that even in my own community, if I call them, I know they'll be there. And that's been invaluable to, to know that I have that type of support. And so it, it's just, you know, um, intentional. Nadine talks about intentional all the time. So for me, first thing in the morning, I'm up and I go for a walk with, with friends and we can talk and we can share and we do pray together. And then I come back and I start my day with my mom and it's like, it's just so refreshing for me. And that's been my joy. That's part of honoring my parents. In, our, in my tradition, to honor our mother and father is to take care of one, to take care of them. And although my dad has transitioned, I know I'm honoring my family by taking care of my mom. So it is, it is joy. It's a joy. This journey has been a joy. And to look at each day how I can make a memory with my mom. Long story short, um, we just came out of February and celebrating Valentine's Day. And so we um, made dinner, husband and I made dinner. We had dinner together. Our son came over. We had a wonderful family time. And um, my son said, let me help wash dishes. And what I said to him was, no, go and sit under your grandmother's feet. Go and learn from your grandmother. And um, in May, we're looking forward to celebrating her 95th birthday. And so um, we've all, we, thank you. <laughs> we've all um, gotten our, our, our shots and my brother, my youngest brother, he's getting ready to retire and he's gonna come in and, and uh, share birthday. And I'm hoping because we do have a circle of friends that we miss dearly. Um, hopefully we can get together and share with one another and celebrate her upcoming 95th birthday. So, so each day I try to find ways to make memories. And those are gonna be lasting memories that we can share together as a family. And so that's, that's where I am. And I'm, I'm so glad, I mean, everybody has a different journey in this caregiving journey, but my mom at 94, she's still sharp, she's witty, she's funny. And so, like I said, I sit on her feet and, and I learn from the queen. I learn from her. And I'm so thankful for that. Matilda, that's so great. I love your advice to your grandson. Um, okay. Um, and Amy, let's start this time with you. So all of you are living this, you're experiencing it. I know we have a lot of caregivers um, who are in the session and also others who have requested the recording. So here's your opportunity to give your most important advice for someone specifically in your stage of life. Because what I love about this panel is you're all in different life stages, right? What's the most important advice you would give to someone in your stage of life who finds themselves in a caregiving role? Miss Amy, you start. Uh, so um, my advice, if someone finds themselves sandwiched, right, between children and uh, parents whom they're taking care of is to not um, compartmentalize, to recognize that the 
the parents and the children, can, they can take care of each other. Even as you're caring for them, they can care for each other. Um, my father, uh, even though he's um, cognitively really challenged now, he can still love and he can still pay attention and he can still adore. And I see that light shine on my children. And so, and that gives him, he can feel that he's doing that for them. That gives him a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, a sense of being in our family. And my children, they can do the same for him and they can help care for him. Even now, like with my mother, when my, my youngest was only six years old, she would hold my mother's hand and she would help her find the bathroom or she would take care of her in some way or she would read her stories. And that gave my, my daughter a sense of purpose. So I, I think my big advice is just let it all kind of blend, recognize that everyone can love each other and take care of each other. Um, and the, the other thing I would really say, I, I'm gonna steal, I'm gonna do two pieces of advice, is That's okay. try, try to really have a strong philosophy about what you're doing, of a strong um, point of view. That, that has helped me so much to return to that. And if, and if you have time to talk about it with, um, I'm speaking now particularly about caring for parents um, before uh, maybe they are unable to express their wishes, it would be great. I know that with my father, he really has a strong desire for um, uh, autonomy and independence over safety. So for example, if he wants to walk down the hall by himself, I will let him do that. It takes a minute for me to say, uh, that makes me very nervous, but I'm gonna let you do that because he, and I think um, not every, I'm not saying that's the right way. I'm saying that's kind of what we hit upon. And it has really helped me to have that point of view um, and maybe think about these things uh, and really just try to um, come up with a consistent way that you're gonna approach things. Because th these, these issues come up all the time where you're like, I have no idea what to do here. I don't know. I don't know if I should, um, you know, let you uh, make your own coffee or whatever. I mean, it sounds trivial, but it actually, but they become big things. And um, having a strong point of view and really thinking about it, I did a lot of reading beforehand, um, is extremely helpful. And self-compassion, self-compassion. Lots of self-compassion. Three things, Amy. Good job. Thank you so much. Matilda, how about you? Your advice. Well, self-care. Self-care is so very, very important. Um, one of the analogies that we have, and, and I know you've heard, probably heard it before yourself, but if we get on an airplane and the oxygen mask comes down, you put it on yourself first and then you help the person next to you. Well, in the caregiving journey, sometimes we're so busy helping everybody else that we're not taking care of ourselves. And so then we end up feeling like we're sucking oxygen. You know, we're, we're trying to barely breathe. It is necessary to take care of oneself. And so having, having the foundation of faith for yourself, uh, being able to um, know when it's time to step back and say, you know, today, I'm going to take that walk or today I'm just going to go and take a bath and, and whatever it is that you need to do to take care of yourself is so important because that brings you back to the table more refreshed and ready to serve and ready to be in the moment with your with the person that you're caring for. So self-care is it's it's in paramount. It, it, it's not an option. It is not an option. That's the advice that I would give. Matilda, thank you so much. An important reminder, I think, of one of the things Nadine led us with. Ray, how about you? Yes, and I think that I have to emphasize that point as well. Make sure you take care of yourself emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, without feeling guilty. You know, from my experience, if you don't do enough self-care, it'll burn out, go resentment. You'll, <clears throat> you'll probably project your frustration onto your loved one, and that's not a good feeling. So um, it, it can be, you know, one hour to two hour block of me time. So uh, for me, it'd be meditation, you know, walk in nature, spend with my friends, you know, have a community 
And most recently, I started watching Korean dramas. I found them highly addictive, so I'm not sure if I could recommend that. And uh, so, oh, and finally, take it one day at a time. So many what ifs, you know, take it one day at a time because we don't know what could happen tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Nadine, do you want to kind of wait? You've already given some great advice, but before we go to kind of question and answer conversation with the audience, do you want to kind of give some final tips of advice? So um, a couple of things. One, I've absolutely enjoyed and appreciated all of the panelists' perspective and really appreciate uh, changing the narrative because it was that concept that ensured that we had representation across the board. And Ray, I want to say that the male perspective is needed. It's so incredibly important. In addition, um, we don't realize it, but more than 40% of the caregivers are male. And so this whole idea of this misconception around who's doing the care, we have 40% of that 53 million uh, number that I talked about earlier that are literally caregivers and they're often unseen and uh, not acknowledged. So I am so glad you are part of this panel and shared your perspective today. There, is, there are two things that I wanna add to the whole um, self-care being non-negotiable non piece, but also to the mindset. I really want every caregiver to understand and recognize that caregiving is happening to you for a reason, and it is to transform who you are. You cannot remain the same person and be the same person, no matter how amazing and fantastic you were prior to your caregiving journey. Caregiving will change you. And it's sometimes there are gonna be days where that process is gonna be painful. It's going to hurt. It's gonna show you sides of yourself that are not pretty. You're not gonna be proud. But that's because you are being required to grow in a different way and to become more expansive in who you are so that you can become your highest self, your highest, your, your highest person. And you can't do that if you don't say yes to the journey and don't allow yourself to be transformed by the experience. And so that is one of the, the nuggets. And I, I just think one of this, the secrets to success in the caregiving journey is recognizing that you have to be willing to change. And then finally, I'll say that your perspective Caregiving is part of your legacy. It's part of what you are giving to your family, to your children, your loved ones, your neighbors, those who are watching you, even uh, um, strangers. I have I had so many times during my mother's caregiving journey where people with complete strangers would walk up to me and say, I really, I really appreciate how you are caring for your mother. Now, I'd be glad that they didn't see me the day before, <laughs> but I recognize that it really affected other people, how I showed up, how I chose to be present, and that it really was an important part of the legacy. You decide what's important for you, for your family, and if caring for a loved one and being there, serving as a caregiver is in fact that, then you get the opportunity to choose, choose a legacy that absolutely um, acknowledges what's, what's really important to you, what matters. Nadine, thank you. So that's a perfect segue now. Uh, we actually are going to stop recording so that people can feel free to put questions in the chat. We are going to, uh, Jennifer, if you can come back on, Jennifer from Denver Public Library will be reading your questions aloud. And we, uh, depending on whether a question is directed to a particular panelist, we might do that, or it might be directed to everyone. So uh, Jennifer, um, everyone, you can start putting your questions in the chat or comments, but um, Jennifer, if you want to um, start reading some of the questions. 
Sure, we do have a couple so far. And um, like Janine said, go ahead and put them in the chat and I will grab them and read them for everybody. Um, we did have a question early on about how to get help from a spouse um, so they might feel more supportive when, when they might be in denial is how they put it. I'll start with that one. So one of the things I didn't mention in sharing my story is that I was exceptionally blessed. I am exceptionally blessed to have an extraordinary spouse who partnered in my caregiving journey. And um, he's a firefighter. He'll be retiring soon, but he's got that special thing in his DNA. So he is exceptional. But one of the things that I um, talk to couples and particularly about is the necessity of the conversation. Having that conversation, life is going to happen. Let's talk about what's important to us. Let's talk about what's important as far as our legacy is concerned. And for my husband and I, taking care of our parents was absolutely paramount. We would be, we would do the things that we needed to do. It was really my husband's idea that my mother moved from California to Colorado. I was, I was literally going to move back to California to take care of, uh, take care of my mom when she needed 24 seven care. So I say it's first, first and foremost, it's the conversation. The conversation is most important with your spouse. The conversation is important with all of the family members and loved ones that are involved and care for the person that needs the primary care. So that discussion and then determining what are the boundaries? What are we able to do? What are we not, what are we not able to do? Having the discussion first really lays the foundation. And then from there, because things happen and, and you find yourself being able to do more. And in some instances you realize I'm no longer able to do. I, I've expended everything that I have. And so now we have to look at the next steps. We have to look at the plan B and a plan C. So conversation is absolutely, communication is the most important thing that you can do, preferably beforehand, but absolutely during the process as things are unfolding to constantly be in communication, what's gonna work, what's not gonna work and coming to a meeting of, of uh, the minds is essential. Anyone else wanna weigh in on that? All right, Jennifer, if you wanna go to another question. Absolutely. We had somebody sharing about um, a really difficult caregiving situation that they're in. They've been married for 42 years. Their spouse was diagnosed with dementia. He's 64 and has um, other health issues as well. And they are 61 and they live with their two daughters. Um, and they're in a tough spot where they're experiencing aggression and uh, emotional um, aggression from their from their person that they're caregiving with. So if you all have any suggestions for that person where they can turn. Mm -hmm. Amy, do you wanna? So I, I hope I understood the person with Alzheimer's is, is the one who's aggressive. Is that right? I think so. Um, we had this uh, problem with my mother. There some people who suffer from Alzheimer's, there is a, um, psychosis component sometimes, or there can be a very aggressive component. And I would really recommend talking to the, your doctor about that because um, medication can really help with it. And I will say I was extraordinarily reluctant to use medication, um, but it, it ended up giving my mother back to herself and ended up giving her back to us. Um, it really, uh, helped us. Oh, I'm seeing that it has not helped you very much. Um, I think we've done a lot in terms of, um, in, in addition to medication, we did a lot in terms of um, ther occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, but without knowing like the details of your individual, yeah, that sounds so hard. I see that now you're worried for your safety. That sounds extraordinarily difficult. Um, and I would definitely reach out to your doctor and see if there are social workers who can help you in that situation. That sounds so hard. And I really, my heart genuinely goes out to you. Yeah. 
Amy, I would like to add to that, that one of the most important resources that I provide on a daily basis to clients across the country is the Alzheimer's Association. There is a chapter in every city. The Alzheimer's Association offers education, training, resources, and support for caregivers. Particularly, we now have over 100 different types of diagnosed dementias. And so, um, you know, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia, but there are over a hundred other different types of dementia. And the Alzheimer's Association will support families in, with education and training and also help you um, really uh, learn skills to help diffuse and de-escalate situations. They'll also help you understand the things that you can do to, um, to, to recognize, you know, when that, um, you know, your, your loved one is triggered and, you know, that, that whole um, uh, escalation process begins. And so amazing courses that are available online now, everything is online. That is definitely one of the pluses, right? to um, the year we've been through is that everything, things that we had to show up for, we can now access online. So for every individual that's uh, dealing with some form of dementia, I, I really, really strongly suggest and encourage that you reach out to the Alzheimer's Association, the local chapter in your area for support. Okay, Nadine, thank you. Jennifer, next question. <clears throat> Yes, here's um, one that I think will um, a lot of people can relate to possibly, but that we don't talk about as much. Um, uh, sorry. For those of us who are living between two worlds as immigrants and refugees, so many of us are dealing with sleepless nights and taking care of in-laws here in the U.S. and back at home where so the support system does not exist like in the U.S., um, they say that advocacy is difficult from overseas, but not impossible. And they're also dealing with the cultural stereotype that you are rich because you live in the U.S. Um, so they've discovered new dimensions and new strategies of long distance caregiving. Um, they call it an uncaptured story. I wonder if anyone else has any thoughts on that. I could jump in. Um, so it's definitely uh, coming from a third world country, they definitely view us as some that we have more access to resources, which is true. Um, at the same time, they do not have the full picture. Um, and on our, with our family, we need to first take care of ourselves to be stronger, right? Uh, before we could actually provide some kind of help overseas, whether sending money or whatever else that we could uh, provide with. So I think for us, we need to make sure that first we, you know, we could take care of our own first, then we could help take care of, um, you know, family overseas. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you. Jennifer. I will uh, read one out loud that we are answering in the chat too, but just to say it aloud, folks were asking if uh, Denver Library resources are just for Denver residents. There are a couple that are only for Denver residents, but the vast majority are available for pre people pretty much everywhere. So um, Amy has put her email in the chat or you can visit our website as well. Um, another question, let's see, any advice for caregiver burnout? Everybody. I'll, start with, <laughs> I'll start with avoid it at all costs, right? And then <laughs> when you realize you haven't avoided it, uh, the reality is it's time to wave the white flag and say, I surrender. I need help. I need time off. I need a vacation, even if it's a staycation where you, you know, you leave home or you, you leave the, um, you leave home and you are able to just spend some time in another place or space so that you can focus on your self-care so that you can rejuvenate. 
burnout is costly. It's costly to everybody. And so we work, we work really hard to teach our caregivers how to avoid burnout. But most of our people, should, you know, by the time they show up, they're in burnout stage. And, um, you know, a lot of times we, we, we so believe that we can do so much more than we actually can. And we find ourselves where we are absolutely exhausted, where we are fried. And all too often, and I, I, I hate to say this, but it is a fact, there are too many caregivers who die before the person they are caring for, particularly those who are caring for loved ones with dementia. And so once I, I, I decide to be that candid with people and, and to ask them, Literally, what is your goal and objective? Your goal and objective is to care for your loved one, but you can't do that if you are not taking care of yourself. You can't do that if you are burning at both ends and not stopping, not recognizing on the daily, you have to, you have to self-care. Talk about a lot about that in Tears in My Gumbo, for sure. So, and I'll, I'll add to that, Nadine, um, I, for me personally, the biggest help for me has been mindfulness, which I did not do at all before I started caregiving, but I have been doing, I've been, and we offer these classes free through the Denver Public Library. So if you're interested in joining us online, please contact me. But I, meditation, um, mindfulness, uh, Qigong have been very important to me because I can't, get away. And so like physically, I can't get away and go someplace for a break. So I have to take the break in my mind. If I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I am also not, I might be um, unique among the panelists and that I'm not religious. I don't have a faith community. So I've really had to create for myself um, some ideas around how uh, mentally I'm going to um, manage what's happening um, and manage the emotions I'm having. So I highly recommend um, mindfulness for people. Um, and uh, as I said before, just a lot of self-compassion. Yeah. Matilda, did you want to? Yeah, I had, a, I had a quick comment. So we were, I, I spoke earlier about the fact that we were empty nesters at the time and going on vacations and planning for that. Well, I need to include, because we did work together as a family, um, my family supported my husband and I to go on those vacations, even though we were still actively caregiving for my mom. And so one year, we had a one-week vacation. The following year, we had two weeks. So um, if you can work with your family and get some time, it's, it's just important in any season that we're in to have something to look forward to. And so um, that, that has helped us a lot as well. So just a thought. Yeah. Ray, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I think uh, Amy already mentioned um, mindfulness. I do a lot of, I think I mentioned meditation. I do a lot of that um, because it, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's uh, having your brain go to the gym. So it allows you to focus <laughs> and it allows you to let go of emotions and you could refocus back. So I think meditation, if you, you know, you just find a quiet place, if you're a beginner, you know, if you think you could do five minutes, do one, go start with something. So yeah, meditation. Great. Thank you. All right, Jennifer. We've got um, two folks in the chat who have sort of similar questions. Um, both of them have parents that are um, having dementia issues, um, but one set of parents is refusing help at all from anybody and they're out of state. The other set is only taking help from family. So they're refusing outside help, only taking family help. So maybe we can talk about uh, when folks are refusing help and if they are only taking help from, from family, if there's a strain on that familial relationship with fellow family caregivers, how are you maintaining those relationships? Anyone, yeah. Okay. So, oh, go ahead, Dean. Go ahead, Nadine. 
Okay. Um, I want to say that with family relationships, I, I always say caregiving always enhances whatever the dynamics are. <laughs> um, it, it, things don't, don't usually automatically get better as a result of the caregiving situation. And so that's where the communication piece comes in. And one of the things that we do is um, family mediation sessions. And they always happened on Zoom before, before the pandemic. And we work, we've worked with families to help families communicate with each other and hear each other. A lot of times, you know, with, because of the family dynamics, it's very difficult for uh, parents to listen to adult children because the adult child is still that 14 year old who you, you know, who was problematic <laughs> in their minds. And so um, the mediation session and uh, the mediation is, uh, is done with a trained mediator, um, a trusted uh, family, uh, a family, uh, a resource person such as a minister or someone that's uh, highly respected by the family unit. And in those types of sections, oftentimes bringing in that mediator allows the family to come to a meeting of the mind and make decisions when otherwise they're not able to, uh, uh, able to do so. So hearing it and listening to the exact same thing from someone who's a neutral party oftentimes serves as a catalyst for moving from point A to point B. And so that's just a suggestion for the individuals who, um, who have the situation in their family where, where one, one family member just will not allow anybody else to come, to come and participate in the process. Sometimes hearing what the toll is that it's, that it's, that's being taken on the primary caregiver and the other family members as well from a neutral party is much more and much well much more well received from that neutral person than it is from a family member. So definitely a recommendation. Okay. Amy, I also saw in the chat um, the issue with uh, the person you're caring for refusing any other person besides you or refusing a non-family member, and that is very hard. And I have experienced that, and um, I. Sometimes you have to make the person you love unhappy by um, uh, leaving them with somebody they don't want to be left with. That being said, what I have found is very slow, very patient, lay the groundwork. Um, my mother refused to have anybody else with her. So I began bringing someone in and just, I would be there too. And we would be there together. And I wouldn't say they were a caregiver. I might say they're just here to tidy up the house or they're just here to um, make a meal for all of us. And I just really slow. Um, and that worked in one or two instances, but I think the very hard reality is sometimes, um, people have to be unhappy for a little while so that you can get a break and that's okay. I'd like to, um, Brandy, if you are still on the call. Um, you had sent me ahead of time what I thought was a really important question about that goes not only to changing the narrative about caregiving, but also about how we treat caregiving for children, how we treat caregiving for older adults differently. And I'm wondering if you would be willing to either put that in the chat or have Jennifer unmute you and ask us the question out loud. I think it's important for everybody I know, don't people love it when I do that? While we're figuring that out, what, can I ask another question while we mm -hmm. get Brandy's? Okay, great. Um, so let's see, somebody asked um, if you have experience or mentioned any other supports and treatments such as music therapy. Jennifer, can you repeat the question one more time? Sure. Someone asked if you have experience or have talked about any other different kinds of supports for caregivers and people receiving caregiving. They specifically asked about music therapy because that's their discipline. I, I use music therapy with my father right now and it's wonderful. Um, it's expensive. I'm just going to be frank. 
I don't, I, my brother pays for it. And I feel really lucky that he does it. It brings my father a great deal of joy. Um, I don't know how you would get something like that. I, I don't know an affordable way um, to do music therapy, but it is a really wonderful thing um, that uh, really helps with cognition and um, voice and all sorts of things and mood. Um, one thing you can do is use music. I use music all the time um, to uh, lift mood, to process emotions with my father, but I'm not a trained music therapist, so. Um, and I have unmuted Brandy, Jennifer. So Brandy, if you want to make your observation, ask your question to the panelists, I thought it was really important when you shared that ahead of time. Great. So my question is, there's a lot of work around FFN providers, friend, family, and neighbor providers for early childhood. And, you know, if your early childhood provider is not available, there's usually a substitute or you can find someone to keep your child. We've noticed during the pandemic, there are no substitutes for caregivers. And so I guess the question is, is there a network or is there any work being done for there to be like a substituting pool of caregivers. And then the other question is, is there ever space for FFN providers, meaning the friend, family, neighbors in early childhood, is there ever space or ideas for them to collaborate with the aging communities caregivers? I always like to end with big questions. So anybody, if you want to wait one, that, that is absolutely a big, great question. And I'm really glad that you asked, you asked that question. So we do have the Colorado Respite um, organization here in, um, in Colorado. And so the Colorado Respite Association has been um, very instrumental in helping with legislation, but also in collabor making sure that networks are collaborating and so that would absolutely be one resource. And in response to your question, during the pandemic, one of the greatest, greatest challenges has been the reduction in the number of home health care workers uh, during COVID-19 because of the, the spread of COVID. And there were many caregivers who, professional caregivers, who had been such an important resource to family caregivers that were no longer available. In many instances, they took themselves out of the market because they didn't want to risk bringing COVID into their homes. And so it has been a huge problem across the country. And I am I'm very, very hopeful that the conversations are happening to address this issue and to um, support and make sure, make, uh, make sure that um, those professional uh, caregivers are protected. Many of them weren't even able to get the vaccine when it first came out because they were not, they were not part of the, um, the, the first, um, the first rain, uh, round and they were not included. Home health care workers were not included. And that was really, um, really difficult and challenging. Fortunately, as vaccines become more available, um, many people are um, getting vaccinated and they are feeling like they can start to return to work. But that's a huge problem, a huge problem and one that absolutely um, must be addressed. And we have to keep having the conversations so that um, those um, individuals will have the advocacy and the support that they need so that they're able to be available to support what I believe is the most important facet of the uh, healthcare network, which is the home caregivers, family caregivers. Um, anyone else, uh, other panelists want to weigh in? All right. Um, so this is a, kind of a great segue to um, our call to action. So first, um, can everybody join me in giving a round of virtual applause to this amazing, amazing panel 
who are willing to literally share their stories, right? I mean, this is incredible. And I am so grateful that when I reached out to each one of you, uh, that you said yes, because I was like, oh, please, 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 would you do this? And everybody's like, yes, we will. So thank you, uh, Ray, Matilda, Amy, Nadine. I want to give a shout out to um, Angel Futher, who with Kindred Communications, um, who has worked on a lot of our blogging. She's currently planning a really exciting anti-ageism public facing campaign. But she's the one, she wrote a series of blogs for us last year. And she wrote a blog about Nadine because we were featuring older adults who are doing amazing things in community and and Angel wrote this and I was reading the blog and I was like I have to meet this woman so um Angel um virtually um thank you for introducing me to Nadine Nadine thank you for willing to be a part of this and, and kicking all of this out um you've got two minutes Nadine to talk about what's next with the caregivers guardian in your campaign and then I'll come back and tell you what's next with what all of this Okay, so I saw support groups coming up in the chat, and I want to share that since the pandemic, TCG, our organization, has offered um, has offered a monthly calling all caregivers call. We uh, do this every Monday, 3 p.m. Matilda is my co-facilitator, and we have caregivers from all across the country that participate in the call. We haven't had a hundred yet, but we, um, every Monday we are available and we encourage you to take advantage. You can sign up for the call on our website, tcgcares.com. And we would love to have you. We would love to support you through the Calling All Caregivers call. And then the other thing that I'll share is our 10, 10 30 campaign. In November of this past year, we launched the 10 Random Acts of Kindness 10,000 uh, books to caregivers in 30, uh, in 30 days campaign. We did this two day, two months before the actual campaign. We got the idea and our team put it together and we made it happen. And so we have been able to distribute, uh, gosh, we haven't hit the 10,000 mark yet, but I think we're over 7,000 books at this point. And um, many of you will be getting uh, copies of the book as a result of the 10 10 30 campaign and um, Denver Public Library's generous uh, contribution to ensure that you all are able to get um, a copy of the books. So grateful for that opportunity and we are now laying the groundwork for 2021 and looking for partners, looking for volunteers to help us raise awareness and shine the spotlight on caregivers. November's National Family Caregivers Month, so that's our targeted time to make sure that people are paying attention and recognizing the caregivers in their world. Great. Nadine, thank you. So I want to thank uh, Denver Public Library. Uh, Jennifer Dewey, do you want to take a bow and say um, anything on behalf of the library before I conclude? Um, no, we, I just want to say thank you so much to all of you, Janine, Nadine, Ray, Amy, Matilda, and everyone who took the time to join us today because there are so many things you can be doing online. So thank you for taking um for coming here with us. We really appreciate it. I feel like this conversation was beautiful and um, I'm so glad that we could be part of it. Um, and again, we're gonna do our best and save the chat and try and get all these resources and everything to everyone. So thank you all so much. We are, we are honored to be a part of, of this program today and these relationships. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you so much in Denver Public Library. It has always been incredible to partner with you. Uh, so from changing the narrative, you will receive uh, from changing the narrative, you'll receive an email, but because I want to compile resources that are, you have also generously provided in the chat while preserving sensitive questions in the chat, I'm going to pull out the resources. We'll create a handout. You'll be receiving an email from us. 100 of you will be receiving a set of Nadine's book, but we'll have a link uh, for those of you who aren't our lucky winners uh, where um, you can uh, purchase them online. 
We do this because we want to change the narrative. We want to change the ideas that people have about caregiving and about older people. So along with it, you'll receive a link from us if you want to get involved in changing the narrative anyway. It might be by being panelists or providing program like this. It might be by if there are policies out there to support caregivers, letting the influential people you know say, you've been part of conversations like this. You are a caregiver. You know what caregivers are going through. And this this is the kind of public policy that we need to support caregiver. While I appreciate everything Nadine and all of our caregivers have said about self-care and, and creating these circles around you, we also know that's not enough. And this is a community. This is something that all of us should do. So we invite you to join us in literally joining the movement to end ageism, to support caregivers, to support older adults and their caregivers. I want to thank you again with Ju uh, Jennifer uh, for your time. Uh, look for this from, uh, from us along with a recorded version. So whether you want to be inspired again or share with other people who you think need to understand the caregiver's journey, you'll have that available. Thank you all so much. We appreciate all of you who are yourselves caregiving, who care for caregivers and are anyway involved. Thank you all so much. Have a lovely, lovely rest of the day. Thank you, my caregivers. I'm so grateful for all of you. Thank you.